us uh, come from a family, and in a family you will uh, find different relationships. You have fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters, and um, sometimes it's not that easy to be in a family. I don't know if you'll agree. And all of us desire to live well with our family. Um, even when things get tough, we want to have a good relationship with our family members. The church is presented in the Bible as a, as a family. That's one of the primary uh, pictures of the church, is we are a family. And in the church, sometimes it's also difficult to live well together. And that's what we desire, is to have relationships where we live well together. And one of the things that God has given us to help us to live well in a family is honor and to create a culture of honor. If, if, if there is honor in a family, um, if there's honor in a community like ours, we are more likely to live well together. And today we are in the third part of a series that we're looking at, uh, looking at the topic of honor. If you were here last week, you would have heard um, me speak from Romans chapter 12, uh, looking at what Paul said to the church in Rome about honoring each other above ourselves. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, more specific relationships in the church and how we honor each other in those relationships. And we'll be looking at another letter that Paul wrote. Uh, and this is a letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. Timothy was Paul's son, spiritual son, son in the faith. Um, and they worked together uh, spreading the gospel. And Paul's first letter to Timothy um, was words of instruction. Because Timothy had uh, been left in Ephesus and he was giving leadership to the church in the city of Ephesus. And Paul writes to him as a young pastor saying, here is some practical wisdom uh, based on the gospel that you and I preach together and live together, here is some practical wisdom on how you should lead this church. And one of the areas that he addresses as he writes to Timothy is how relationships are to be carried out in a way that is honoring. So if you have your Bible with you, Please turn with me to 1 Timothy, and we'll be in chapter 5. We have the verses up, but I hope you've got your own Bible with you uh, that you can refer to. And we are going to read verses 1 to 4, and then we are going to read verses 17 to 20. 1 Timothy 5, verses 1 to 4, and then 17 to 20. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn first of all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents. 
for this is pleasing to God. Then we jump down to verses 17 to 20. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses. But those elders who are sinning, you are to reprove before everyone so that the others may take warning. So Paul had told Timothy that he shouldn't let anyone look down on him because he was young. But he should set an example and that he should exercise the spiritual gift that God had given him. In other words, Timothy should not shy away from leading the church. However, as he led the church, there was a proper way for him to treat the members of the church. And this is part of that proper way. And what we notice from these verses is that the church is, as I've said, a family. Fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters. And the culture that Paul is helping Timothy to establish is a culture of honor. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. As a leader, Timothy had to be able to correct members of the church. It's part of being a leader. Rebuke is sometimes necessary as part of bringing correction. If an older man requires correction, Paul is saying, Timothy, the way to do it is not to rebuke him harshly. Instead, you are to exhort him as if he were your father. We are to urge him. We are to encourage him as we would our own father. Fathers are respected. Fathers are honored. If your father makes a mistake today, do you go to him and just let him have it? Shout at him and let rip on your father? No, you even if he's made a mistake, you, you go to him and you speak to him in a way that is respectful. In a way that is honoring. You give him honor. Paul is not saying, Timothy, I want you to shy away from correcting an older man. He's not saying, don't correct an older man. And our view might be, older men, I don't even correct them. If he does something wrong, he's a mze. We don't go there. That might be our view. And that's not what Paul is saying to Timothy. Paul is saying, actually, you can correct an older man. You, you can speak to him and bring correction. But it is the way that you do it that matters. You do it in a way that honors his age. The relationship between Paul and Timothy was a father-son relationship. And there were probably times when Paul and Timothy, as they worked together, spreading the gospel, that they wouldn't have agreed. How would have Timothy treated Paul in those situations? Paul is reminding him, hey, the same way you treated me as an older man in your life, as a father in your life, 
Well, that's how you are to treat the older men in your church, in that community. I was recently in, in Johannesburg and uh, I was there for a church leaders con- conference, or meeting rather. Uh, a few of us from our advanced churches in Africa came together. Um, advanced is our family of churches. We belong to this family of churches called Advance. And I was there um, with a great friend of mine. We've been friends for years. We're in the car together. He's a lead elder of our uh, former church in Johannesburg. And we're in the car together. Uh, two, two of his kids, his two boys in the passenger seat. And uh, we're driving home. We get to an intersection and he's about to turn, and he's about to turn, this lady starts crossing the road, and then these cars start coming, and he's getting kind of agitated and upset, as we all do sometimes in traffic. Um, eventually, we, we do turn, and after we turn, his older son says, Dad, something along the lines of, Dad, what you did wasn't very nice. And... Um, I just thought, man, what a son. He has just told his father that what you did is not very nice. He was correcting his dad. But the way he did it, it was so respectful, so honoring. I just thought, what a kid. And his father absorbed it well, and we just carried on. That's the kind of thing I believe that Paul is encouraging here. He's saying... We can correct the older men, but we do it in a way that's respectful, in a way that is honoring. I just want us to have a look around the room right now and see the older men in this room. I'm not going to get the older men to put their hands up. I think we know who they are. Daniel Kijo claims to be an older man. Yeah, to some of you, he might be actually. That might not be too far-fetched. But I just want us to look around and see the older men in the room. I just want to encourage us, treat them as fathers. Treat them as fathers. He goes on to say, treat younger men as brothers. Timothy was to treat the younger men as his brothers. Brothers don't get the same kind of respect that fathers get. You can be more direct with a brother. I grew up with two brothers. I have three boys. I know what brothers are like. It's fun and games. And the relationship between brothers is different with your father, but it's still a potent relationship. There's there's friendship, there's, uh, there's fun, there's honor, there's loyalty, uh, there's banter. And, you know, it's appropriate to correct each other if required. It's interesting that Paul says to Timothy, treat younger men as brothers. Because he's just said, treat older men as fathers. So, The logic could be, if older men are fathers, younger men should be sons. He doesn't say that. He says, treat younger men as brothers. Now, Timothy was young, so as he was with the other younger men in the church, it may have been far-fetched to say, Timothy, the younger men in the church, they're like sons to you. Maybe a bit far-fetched. Another way to think of it is, here's Timothy, he's, a, he's the leader in this church. And if you are a leader in a church, there's already like a gap between you and those that you're leading. A brother is at your level. When, when Paul says, treat the younger men as brothers, he's closing the gap between Timothy and the other younger men in the church. 
the Africa Bible Commentary says, African pastors who take Paul's advice to treat the young men in their church as their brothers will create a bond of friendship that will give men freedom to share openly about their lives and the problems they face. Treat them as brothers and it opens up friendship and relationship. It's quite striking that after Jesus rose from the dead, he said to the women who found his empty tomb, he said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Here is Jesus. He is master, Lord, teacher. He's defeated the grave, risen from the dead. And he says, go and tell my brothers. He was all these other things, but there was a level at which Jesus connected with those that were following him as a brother. Closing that gap as a brother. I just want you to take a look around the room again and, and see the younger men in this room. Are there any younger men in this room? If you're a younger man, we're all old men. That's the, the church is dead. The younger men in this room, treat them as brothers. Freddie Chiara, did I just see you put your hand up as a younger man? Oh my goodness. Let's not ask for full disclosure there. Treat them as brothers. Older women as mothers. Treat older women as mothers. Mothers are respected. Mothers are honored. If you think about your mother today, um, it's honor. It's respect. I, I, I passed through a, a birthday party yesterday for uh, uh, Subira, the daughter of Fisher and Noella. And there were two mothers there. Mama Kath, Mama Noella, and another mother in their family that I was kind of meeting for the first time. And man, it's, it's Shkamo. Shkamo. It's, it's respect. It's, it's honor. Some of the worst insults ever coined in the world are insults against mothers. Because they know that if you say something bad about someone's mother, you have hit a nerve. Mothers are to be honored. And for Timothy, these words would have, you know, they would have touched him because his own mother, Eunice, she had played such a special place in, in his life. She had uh, brought him into the Christian faith. She was an amazing mother. So he's thinking, yeah, man, my mother's awesome. But even if she hadn't done that, mothers are to be honored because they are mothers. So here's Timothy. He's got the gift of God on him. He's not to shrink back from leading. He's to lead with courage and authority, set an example. But Paul is saying, hey, listen, if there are older women in your church, lead with humility. Lead in a way that honors those older women. You should see those older women as people that you can still learn from. As people that can still nurture you. That's what mothers do. They nurture. Even Timothy could still be nurtured. He could still be helped as a leader. Treating these older women with honor. 
Paul was actually writing from experience because he knew what it was like to have someone be a mother to him. At the end of his uh, letter to the Romans, in chapter 16, verse 13, he says, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me too. So even the great apostle Paul knew what it was like to honor older women as mothers. The miracle working, church planting, member disciplining, full of the Holy Spirit, full of God's word, Apostle Paul, he's saying, hey, I've got some mothers in my life as well that I honor. And you, Timothy, you must do the same. Some of the older women in this church do not have biological children but they can still have children because they are to be treated as mothers. So I want us to take another look around the room and I want us to see the older women here. We are to treat them as mothers. Younger women as sisters with absolute purity. The young leader Timothy was to treat younger women as sisters with absolute purity, with all purity. Younger women are to be given the honor that would be given to a sister. Now think about it. If you are a a guy here and you have sisters, how do you treat your sisters? What do brothers do? Brothers protect their sisters. Brothers defend the honor of their sisters. That's how we to treat the younger women. And the reference to purity here is reference to sexual purity. So Timothy's conduct with younger women was not to contain any sexual impurity. As a leader, under public scrutiny, observed, seen as he goes, there should have been no hint that there was anything sexually impure in the way he related to the younger women in the church. He gave no reason for someone to think Could there be something inappropriate there with one of those younger women in the church? And the way to do that is to treat them as his sisters. As brothers, we should be thinking the only place that is appropriate for sex for my sister or for me is in marriage. So I'm going to protect my sister and I'm going to protect myself in this area of sex until it gets to marriage. And if somewhere along the way one of those sisters starts to look like she could become a wife, you know the church is the only place I know where your sister can become your wife and it's okay. If one of those sisters starts to look like a wife, well, you you handle that with honor. You honor her, you honor God, and you honor the church that he has put you in. Until then, you treat her as a sister. So I want us to take a look around the room. And this might be hard for some of us young men right now. The younger women, treat them as sisters. Treat them as sisters. He goes on to say, give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. 
But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn first of all to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents for this is pleasing to God. That phrase, proper recognition, means honor. Paul is saying honor the widows who are really in need. The ESV translation of the Bible says, honor widows who are truly widows. And Paul explains who are the widows who are really in need. If we read down in that passage, he tells us that these widows who are really in need are older widows that won't have the desire to remarry like younger widows would. They are widows who were faithful to their husbands. They are widows whose own relatives are not able to care for them. They are widows who are well known for their good deeds. The church should honor this group. And the church actually had a track record up until this time of doing so. The first church in Jerusalem, they had a situation where the church was growing and the number of widows was growing and they actually had to come to a place where they stopped and said, how are we going to deal with this situation of widows in the church? We need to come up with the solution. Our religion, our faith, the gospel requires that we respond to the fact that there are widows in this community. Before bringing the needs of the widow to the church, her own family should be responsible for caring for her needs. This is one of the ways that we obey God's commandment to honor our parents. And Paul actually goes on to say that if anyone does not care for his own relatives, he's worse than an unbeliever. Because as you observe society, even those who don't believe in Jesus Christ, they care for their own family. They look out for their own relatives. They care for the widows in their families. What more us who have put our faith in Christ? Shouldn't we be caring for the widows in our families? When my father passed away uh, 20 years ago, it left my mother as a widow. And by then she had left the working world. So it was up to me and my siblings to come together and care for her. And uh, we did that even as we got married, you know, up until the time she died, we were, we were caring for her. Um, Trudy's mother has been a widow for almost, almost 30 years. And uh, Trudy took on the responsibility as a firstborn, um, together with her siblings, of caring for their mother. And we've also, since we got married, we've played our part, as small as it's been, but we've played our part in caring for her mother. It's the Bible. If there are any widows here in this community that are not being cared for, either by their own relatives or by us as a church, we need to know about it so that we can change that. Because that's not acceptable. We need to care for these women who are truly in need. Let's turn to elders. Verses 17 to 20. The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it is brought by two or three witnesses, but those elders who are sinning, 
you are to reprove before everyone so that the others may take warning. Elders here, it's not the same as the older men that we read about at the beginning of the passage. Elders here refer to the men that direct the affairs of the church, that lead the church. They are also called overseers in the Bible. They are also called uh, shepherds, pastors in the Bible. This is who Paul is making reference to. And two chapters earlier, in chapter 3 of this uh, letter to Timothy, uh, Paul had actually said, this is what you should look for in an overseer. This is what you look for in an elder. Now he's saying, as the elders carry out their responsibilities of leading the church, giving direction to the church, this is how you are to treat them. This is how you are to honor them. One of the ways in which elders direct the affairs of the church is through the work of preaching and teaching. If you are part of a church, the preaching and teaching that happens in that church is a significant part of how you are being directed. It's a significant part of how you are being led. It's something to take seriously. So pray that it is decent preaching and teaching because it is important for our spiritual direction. Now let's look at this phrase whose work is preaching and teaching. The word work here means toil. It literally means effort that makes you tired. Anyone who is faithful to preaching and teaching and wants to do it well knows that it is work. It is toil that makes you tired. As you read the Bible, as you make sense of Bible passages and you try to see how to bring them to the congregation, as you read through commentaries and other resources, as you pray, as you write and rewrite, as you practice your sermon, as you think of how to preach in a way that connects with the people, as you think of application, as you filter that uh, illustration there, as you come back to it and try and go through it again, as you tweak here and tweak there, it is work that makes you tired. For most preachers, it is hours of preparation that goes into a 30 to 40 minute message. And if elders are leading well, if they are carrying out their duties in a way that honors God, we can say that's what it means to lead well, in a way that honors those that they are leading, then Paul says they are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. They should receive twice as much honor. And there's been debate as to what does that really mean. Well, Paul does give us some indication of what he means by double honor because he refers to Deuteronomy 25 verse 4 which says, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. And this was part of the law that God gave to the Israelites through Moses. It means that as an ox is working to get the grain out of the husk, it should not be muzzled so that it can eat. The ox is working, it's treading the grain, treading the grain. Well, let it eat as it does that. Paul also makes reference to the words of Jesus in Luke 10, verse 7. The laborer deserves his wages. Also a principle that is established in the Old Testament. So when we think of double honor, 
part of it, at least, is reference to how elders are paid. Double honor suggests that elders should be paid well. They should be paid in a way that reflects that preaching and teaching is hard work. In a way that reflects that they will get tired from the work of preaching and teaching. In addition to the other things that they do to direct the affairs of the church. Now the question is, where do we find the money to pay elders? Certainly there are different sources, aren't there? But the source that is most in control for us as a church is our own giving. That's the one that we can control the most. Even as we think of different ways that can be given to pay for elders. Is my giving, is our giving being done in such a way that we can have elders, and it's not just an elder, it's elders who can give enough focused attention to the hard work of directing the affairs of the church. I subscribe to a few church leaders resources, pop different things into my inbox uh, almost on a weekly basis. And this week, uh, I happened to read this one from sermoncentral.com. It says, on average, Americans give away just 3% of their income to churches and charitable causes. I am not trying to single out Americans. It just so happens Americans have the best data on everything. Man, they just collect information and the rest of the world has access to that. However, do you think that this statistic might reflect the situation here? Do you think it might reflect some of what's going on in this room? Do you think there is room for you and I to be more generous in light of how generous God has been to us, giving us His very best in His Son, Jesus Christ? Do you think that our giving, your giving, my giving can contribute to us being a church that shows double honor to our elders. Timothy goes on to say, do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it was brought by two or three witnesses. So he was not to receive, he was not to accept any accusation against an elder unless it was brought by two or three witnesses. Now this was not special treatment of elders. This is a principle that God had already established from the Old Testament. And it was being repeated here. So in Deuteronomy 19, we see this principle being established there as part of the law. We see it in Matthew 18 in dealing uh, with, in exercising church discipline. Paul states it in 2 Corinthians 13 as well. This honors the elders and it honors the church. However, Although elders are to be honored, elders are not above correction. The instruction on them ends on a rather sober note, saying elders who are sinning are to be reproved, which means to be rebuked before everyone so that others may take a warning. In other words, if the accusation against an elder is true, there must be consequences 
and the consequences are to be public. That's very sobering. So we honor elders, but we must honor the church as a whole. Coming to close now. Just reflecting on what we heard earlier from Matt and Trudy about softening our hearts. This is one of those messages, even as I was preparing, I was like, God, soften my heart so I can deliver it with faith and a clear conscience. But as we come to land, just thinking about the future and what the future could be. Because what the Word of God is supposed to do is it's supposed to be like seed that is planted in our hearts and minds that hopefully falls on soft hearts, good soil, takes root, bears fruit, and gives us a harvest of righteousness. And that's a future thing, isn't it? And the future starts, well, when we leave here. Starts this afternoon, starts tomorrow, starts next week. I'm just like, man, imagine what our church could be like if we seriously decided to honor each other in the different ways that the Bible has spoken about this morning. Honor the older men. Honor the younger men as brothers. The older women as mothers. The younger women as sisters. Care for the widows in our community. And honor elders we would move forward, wouldn't we, as a church, towards becoming a more honoring community, towards establishing this culture of honor. And as we honor each other more, we're actually honoring God more as well. So dear friends, brothers and sisters, I hope that as we leave here this morning, something will change in each of us. There's application for each one of us to go and say, that is for me. God help me in that area to be more honoring of the community that you have put me in. I'm going to pray. Lord, thank you for the privilege of hearing your word. Your word brings life. Your word is truth. Your word transforms. It changes. It equips. It moves us towards you, towards the kind of life that you want us to live. Lord, thank you that you have moved us as a church towards this topic of honor. God, we pray today that you would help us to honor each other as your word has said. To honor the older men as fathers. To honor the younger men as brothers. To honor the older women as mothers the younger women as sisters with all purity, to honor the widows among us, to honor elders in our community. Lord, may this word fall on good soil. May it take root. May it bear fruit so that we can be a more glorifying community that honors you. 